So first of all, welcome back to Henry page 113, section 7. <coughs> Today is day number 21 in week number 11. Wow, week number 11. Well, uh, we went through the midterm exam last Friday, and so if you check on the new Buddha environment, uh, it needed one block to the last block. You can see I've already posted the midterm paper here, and also the suggested answer. It's highly recommended that you go through the suggested answer because the suggested answer includes the answers to every one of the 11 problems there. Okay? <coughs> so, if you're interested, we can also go through them once very quickly and let you take a look at it before we come to the topics of today. Now, remember, this is the month of November. That means you have to do the team project. Okay, you have four weeks tonight to do the team project. And if you look at the submissions links there, you see that the team project includes you need to come up with a proposal, okay, which is what you want to do. And then you need to write a report of what you can do and have done. And finally, you need to create a PowerPoint to demonstrate, to present what you need, okay. And of course, we still have a one or two, two set of exercise for you to do in integrations. So, um, these three parts will give you the 20% of the project score, okay? Together with the presentations in class. And so it's very important that you have four weeks time to do this, and we will finish the presentations before the end of the semester and then you will have the final exam, all right? Uh, I tell you a little bit secret, in the final exam, I will still give you choices of the questions. Normally, in the final exam, they do not give choices, but I will give choices, so you can select questions. <coughs> wow, I got back my code there. So, allow me to uh, fast forward to the suggested answers of the midterm exam, just quickly go through some, all right? So, so you can um, see that here. All right, so just this way. Yes. Okay. So let's see if I can see that in. Yes, that's already in one page. The fourth step that is required for the slope predictor definition is to write the definitions of the slope, substitute into the definitions a formula of the given functions, make algebraic simplifications until step four can be carried out, and determine the values of the limit as h approaches zero. So if you use these first principles to do it, you have to write down this very important formula at the very beginning. And then you have to apply this by using f of x is equal to this equation. <coughs> and then you plug in in a fashion like this. So this is the most um, troublesome step because you have to simplify something as complex as this. So you need to do some kind of declarations like this. That is the most complicated point. But if you have already done the practice, this is a very traditional method of doing it. All right. So, so at the end of this, you got something like as simple as this, and you plug in when x is equal to two, you got this value. So f is equal to minus one over sixteen. Okay. So it should be something like this. The second question, okay, is the question which tests you on the basic understanding of this relationship, inequalities. Okay, so you plug in something like this, and you multiply this with that, and you got a very specific values. And we call this the squeeze theorem, all right? So both x squared and minus x squared approaches zero, as x approaches zero. So we say by squeeze law, this is equal to zero, okay? So you need to involve some theories of reasoning like this. And then this one is quite famous, number three, and actually part of this has already been solved in the examples in class. 
you have to divide it into different parts. All right, and then a lot of these has to be expressed like your thinking. And for this, we again have to use principles like this to do it. And towards the end, we got this values. And for that, it's very simple to just write that like this. I didn't specify which way to do it, but you can do it by intuitions. And for this one, uh, people are not saying a lot about the sign. X or X cubed. And <coughs> this is a little bit complicated, right? But if you look at it, okay, you can do it easily. Right, but the rest of this is not complicated. And uh, that is an applications problem number nine, okay? And uh, you need some kind of thinking, and uh, I want to see how mature you are in terms of doing that. But if you don't like this kind of thing, you do not need to choose this one. So make sure you study this reasoning here. And then you got the differentiations here, okay? And then uh, you got that set to zero, and you can find a relationship with x. You get the one, and then once you got x, you got y, and then everything could be done, okay? And when a uh, student asks me what is meant by a yacht, and yacht is a good tweet, okay? So you can do it like this. All right, number 10 is something like this, and you know that uh, we can use problems like this, which is what I'm proving. <coughs> The last one seems to be complicated, but I do not know how many of you use the rules of um, logarithmic differentiations, but that's okay. So make sure that you study the answers carefully and then learn the techniques, and this is what we call the steps, all right? Come back, study those answers at your own time, sometime tonight. Now today, we have to say that uh, we stopped where in week number 9 last time in order to cover the remaining of the midterm and today we restarted there and so we are somewhere in week number 9 and um, we need to come back here to make sure you know where we are. Last time, we stopped at lecture number 11 Okay, today we continue with the applications of the concepts with related rates because we need to help you to propose a question that is a question. Your project is proposing a question to solve and the questions could be the application of a specific concept and since we have been doing calculus for the past 9 weeks, actually 10 weeks, Actually, I want to show you more examples of how to apply what you learned in the derivative to solve typical problems. And so today, in lecture number 12, I would like to show you specific examples of how you can use the concept you've learned so far to solve some typical problems. And besides doing that, I want to start up with a very simple idea which is here called the optimizations in calculus to make sure you understand what is meant by optimizations. Today we're going to talk about another very common application of derivatives, optimization. Optimization. This will be the last application we cover before moving on to integrals, where we'll answer the second fundamental question of calculus, how to find the area underneath the curve. Optimizations. Optimization is all about finding the extremes of a function. Basically, you're looking for the largest and smallest values that a function attains on a given range. These kinds of points are called the function's extrema, but you'll also hear specific points referred to as local or global maxima and local or global minima. We've already mentioned extrema and maxima and minima, which might not be terms we're familiar with. Let's visualize what we mean for a second by looking at the graph of this function. Let's pretend we were asked to find the extrema of this function on the range of x equals negative 2 to x equals 2. On this range, we can see that the function is at its highest at x equals 2, and at its lowest at x equals negative 2. Because the function is higher at x equals 2 than anywhere else, you can say that x equals 2 is its global maximum on this range. Similarly, because the function is lower at x equals negative 2 than anywhere else, you can say that x equals negative 2 is the global minimum. 
Keep in mind that the highest and lowest points on a range are not the only points we're interested in. We also care about points that are the highest or lowest points in the neighborhood of points around them. For example, this point here is a local minimum because it is the lowest point in the immediate vicinity. In the same way, this point is a local maximum because it is the highest point in the immediate vicinity. Now that we have a visual idea of what we're looking for, here's a summary of the steps we'll follow to figure out the largest and smallest values a graph attains in a given range. Take the derivative, five critical points, all critical points in Let's go through these in more detail by trying them out on the function we looked at earlier. First, we'll take the derivative of the original function, then set the derivative equal to zero and solve for x. The solutions are the function's critical points. Critical points are potential points of extrema. We can't say yet for sure whether the critical points represent local or global maximums, local or global minimums, or none of the above. We have to test them to find out. To test them, we have to plot them on a number line. Then, we'll pick one value on the number line to the left of the leftmost critical point, one value to the right of the rightmost critical point, and one value between every critical point. Each of these in-between points will represent the behavior of the graph on that range. In other words, negative two will tell us the behavior of the graph from negative infinity to negative one. Zero will represent what the graph does between negative one and one third, and one will tell us what the graph is doing between one third and positive infinity. Now we'll plug the test values into the derivative we found earlier. When we get a positive answer, we know that the function increases on that test point's range. If we get a negative answer, then we know that the function decreases on the range that the test point represents. As we use each of the test values to test each range, we'll indicate the result on the number line with a direction arrow that gives us a visual representation of the results. The direction arrow indicates the direction of the graph, so they represent a very rough picture of what the graph looks like which means we can see from the direction arrows that this point is a maximum and this one is a minimum. Now we know that we have a maximum and a minimum, but we still don't know whether these points are local extrema or global extrema. To find out, we have to plug each of the critical points and the endpoints of the range into the original function. Doing so will tell us the function's actual value at these points, and we'll be able to compare all of them to see which are the highest and lowest. When we plug the critical points and the endpoints into the original function, we get the actual values of the function at those points, and we can see that the function is highest at x equals 2, which makes it the global maximum. The function is lowest at x equals negative 2, which makes it the global minimum. That means that we're left with x equals negative 1 as the local maximum, and x equals 1 third as the local minimum. Now that we've covered the basics of the optimization, let's turn to applied optimization to see how this tool could be used in the real world. We're going to review a commonly studied real world example, but first, let's talk about the steps you'll follow to solve an applied optimization problem. Generally, the steps you'll follow to solve an applied optimization problem are, one, write down everything you've been given and exactly what you need to find. Two, set up your equations, one for the constraint, and the other to optimize. Three, solve the constraint equation for one of the variables so that you can plug it into the optimization equation. Four, after plugging into the optimization equation from the constraint equation, take the derivative of the optimization equation to find your critical point. Keep in mind that there may be a second critical point that you have to eliminate. Five, finally, make sure to answer the question you were really asked you can use the first or second derivative test to double check yourself and ensure that you minimized or maximized appropriately. Let's work through a common example. Here's the problem. You need to build an open-topped rectangular box that has a volume of 972 cubic inches. The bottom of the box must be twice as long as it is wide and you're asked to find the dimensions of the box that will minimize its surface area. The first thing to do is to draw a picture of our open-topped box. It's always best to draw a picture of what we're dealing with. 
we know that the length is twice the width, so we can call the length 2x and the width x. We also know that the volume is 972 cubic inches. Since we've been asked to find the dimensions that minimize surface area, we know that the equation we're going to optimize will be an equation for the surface area of the box. The constraint equation will be an equation involving the volume of the box and its dimensions, since those are the constraints within which we've been asked to work. If we call the unknown height h, then we can write the constraint equation as 972 equals 2x times x times h, because we know that the equation for the volume of a box is length times width times height. The optimization equation for the surface area is A equals XH plus XH for the two ends, plus 2XH plus 2XH for the two long sides, plus 2X squared for the bottom. We need to get our optimization area equation down to one variable, which means we have to plug in for H. We can manipulate the constraint equation to find that H is 972 over 2X squared, or 486 over X squared. Now we can take this value for h and plug it into the optimization equation. We can start to calculate critical points by taking the derivative of our optimization equation, setting that equal to 0, and solving for x. We find that our critical points are x equals 0 and x equals 9. Because we're talking about the dimensions of a box, we know that x equals 0 cannot be a solution. So x equals 9 is our only valid critical point. Since x equals 9, we can calculate the dimensions as 9 by 18 by 6. To ensure that we found the correct dimensions, we can confirm that x equals 9 is in fact a local minimum of our function. Using the same process we used in the last example, we can plot x equals 9 on our number line, then pick values on either side of it, like 8 and 10. We'll plug 8 into the first derivative of our optimization equation to find that it's negative. Then we'll plug 10 into the first derivative of our optimization equation to find that it's positive. The negative then positive pattern indicates that 9 is a local minimum of the function, which means that the critical point of x equals 9 and dimensions of 9 by 18 by 6 do in fact minimize the surface area. Hopefully that gives you a clearer picture of how to deal with optimization problems and their applications. Next time, we'll start talking about integrals and we'll answer the second fundamental question of calculus, how to find the area beneath the curve. I'll see you then. Okay, you got the first understanding of what is meant by optimizations and calculus. Let's get back to our regular lecture to understand the meanings of related grades. Okay, we are using almost the same set of concepts to help us to understand this. Okay, related grades. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, in, the, in the 12th lecture, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, maxima and minima, and let's finish up what we did last time. We really only just started with maxima and minima, and then we're going to talk about related rates. So, right now I want to give you some examples. In the final example, I'm oh, sure max minima problem this <laughs> And we're going to start with a, with a fairly basic one. So what's the, the, the thing about max and min problems? The main thing is that we're asking you to do a little bit more of uh, the interpretation of word problems. So many of the problems are expressed in terms of words. Um, and so in this case, we have, we have a wire, which is length one, cut into, into two pieces. And then uh, each piece encloses a square. Sorry, encloses a square. And the problem, so this is the setup, and the problem is to find um, the, um, 
So you enlarge the stair and you close. All right, so here's the problem. Now, in all of these cases, in all of these cases, there's a bunch of words, and your job is typically to draw a diagram, okay? So the first thing you want to do is to draw a diagram. In this case, it can be fairly schematic. Here's your unit length, and when you draw the diagram, you're going to have to pick variables. So that, those are really the, the, the two main tasks to set up the problem. So you're drawing a diagram. This is like word problems of old in grade school through high school. Draw a diagram and um, uh, name, name the variables. So we'll be doing a lot of that today. So here's my unit length. And if I'm going to choose the variable x to be the length of one of the pieces of wire, and that makes the other piece 1 minus x. And that's pretty much the whole diagram, except that there's something that we did with the wire after we cut it in half. Namely, we built two little boxes out of it, like this. These are our squares. And their side lengths are x over 4 and 1 minus x over 4. All right? So, so far, so good. And now we have to think, well, we want to find the largest area. So I need a formula for area in terms of the variables that I've described. And so that's the last thing. I'll give the level letter A as the label for the area. And then the area is just the square of x over 4 plus the square of 1 minus x. Whoops, that's strange 2 got in there, over 4, All right? Okay, so far so good. Now, the instinct that you will have, and I'm going to yield to that instinct, is we should charge ahead and just differentiate, all right? That's all right, we'll find the critical points. So we know that those are important points, so we're gonna find the critical points. In other words, we take the derivative we said, uh, the derivative of a with respect to x equal to zero. All right, so if I do that differentiation, I get uh, the, uh, well, so the first one, x squared over 16, that's, that's uh, 8, sorry, um, that's x over 8, right, that's the derivative of this, and if I differentiate this, I get, uh, well, the derivative of 1 minus x squared is 2 times 1 minus x times a minus 1. So it's minus 1 minus x over 8. All right? So there are two minus signs in there. I'll let you ponder that differentiation, which I did by the chain rule. All right? Well, hang on a sec, OK? Just wait until we're done. All right, so here's the derivative. All right? Is there a problem? Uh, right, so there's a 1 16th here. This is x squared over 16, and so it's 2x over 8. Well, over 16, sorry, which has an 8. All right? Okay. That's okay. All right, so now, uh, this is equal to 0 if and only if, if and only if, x is equal to 1 minus x, that's 2x is equal to 1, or in other words, x is a half. All right? So there's our critical point. So x equals a half is the critical point, and the critical value, which is what you get when you evaluate a at 1 half, is uh, a half divided by 4, that's an eighth. All right, so that's an eighth squared plus an eighth squared, which is 1 over 32. All right? So, so far, so good. But we're not done yet, all right? We're not done. Right? 
So why aren't we done? Because we haven't checked the endpoints. All right, so let's check the endpoints. Now, in this problem, the endpoints are really sort of excluded. The ends are between 0 and 1 here. That's the possible lengths of the, uh, of the cut. And so what we should really be doing is evaluating in the limit. So that would be the right-hand limit as x goes to 0 of a. And if you plug in x equals 0, what you get here is 0 plus 1 over 4 squared, which is 1 16th. All right, and similarly at the other end, that's 1 minus, 1 from, from, from the left, we get a quarter squared plus 0, which is also a 16th. So what you see is that the schematic picture of this function, and this isn't even so far off from being the right picture here, is that its level here is a 16th, and then it dips down and goes up. Right? This is a half, this is 1, and this level here is a half that. This is a 1 over 32. All right? So we did not find, when we found the critical point, we did not find the largest area enclosed. We found the least area enclosed. So if you don't pay attention to what the function looks like, not only will you about half the time get the wrong answer, you'll get the absolute worst answer. You'll get the one which is the polar opposite from what you want. All right? So you have to pay a little bit of attention to the function that you've got. And in this case, it's just very schematic. It dips down and goes up. And that's true of pretty much most functions. They're fairly simple. They maybe only have one critical point. They only turn around once. But then maybe the critical point is the maximum, or maybe it's the minimum. Or maybe it's neither, in fact. So we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing that maybe some other time. All right, so what we find here is that we have the uh, least area enclosed. Enclosed is a 16, is, sorry, a 32nd, right? And this is true when um, x equals 1 half. So these are equal squares. All right? And most, when there's only one square. Which is more or less the limiting situation if one of the, uh, one of the pieces disappears. All right? Now, so that's, that's the, the, the first kind of example. And, and I just want to make one more comment about terminology before we go on. And I will introduce it with the following question. What is the minimum? All right. So, so what, what, what is the minimum? Yeah. Right, the lowest value of the function. So the answer to that question is 1 over 32. Okay? Now, the problem with this question, and you will, so that refers to the minimum value. which is, where is the minimum? And the answer to that is x equals a half. Okay? So one of them is the minimum point. And the other one is the minimum value. All right? So they're, they're two separate things. Now, the problem is that people are sloppy. And especially since you usually find the, the critical point first and the value that is plugging in for A second, people will stop short and they'll give the wrong answer to the question, for instance. Now, both 
questions are important to answer. You just need to have a word to, to, to put there. So this is a little bit careless. When we say what is the minimum, some people will say a half. And that's literally wrong. They know what they mean, but it's just wrong. And when people ask this question, they're being sloppy anyway. They should maybe be a little clearer and say what's the minimum value? Or where is the value achieved? It's achieved at, or where is the minimum value achieved? Where is min achieved would be a better way of phrasing this, this second question so that it, it has an unambiguous answer. And when people ask you for the minimum point, they're also, well, so why is that we call it the minimum point? We have this word critical point, which is what x equals a half is a critical value. And so I'm making those same distinctions here. But there's another notion of a minimum point. And this is an alternative, if you like. The minimum point is the point a half, 1 over 32. Right? That's a point on the graph. It's the point, well, so I'll, that graph is way up there, but I'll just put it on there. That's, that's this point. And you might say min there. You might point to this point and you might say max. Similarly, this one might be a max. Okay? So, in other words, so what this means is simply that um, people are a little sloppy, and sometimes they mean one thing and sometimes they mean another. All right? And you're just stuck with this uh, because there will be some authors who will say one thing and some people will mean another, and you just have to live with this little bit of annoying ambiguity. All right? Yeah? Okay, so that's a good, very good. So here we go. Find the largest area enclosed. So that's sort of a trick question, isn't it? So there are, there are, there are various, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing to ask. Um, that's sort of a trick question. Why? Because according to the rules, we're trapped between the two maxima at something which is strictly below. So in other words, one answer to this question would be, and this is the answer that I would probably give, is 1 16th. But that's not really true, because that's only in the limit. As x goes to 0, or as x goes to 1 minus. And if you like, most is when you've only got one square, which it breaks the rules of the problem. All right? So essentially, it's a trick question. Right? But I would, I would answer it this way because that's the most interesting part of the answer, which is that it's 1 16th, and it occurs really when you only, when, when one of the squares disappears to nothing. All right, so now, uh, let, let's do another example here, and uh, I just want to illustrate the, sort of the second, the second uh, style or the second type of question. Yeah. So the question is, um, since the question was, what was the largest area, why did we find the least area? The reason is that when we go about our procedure of looking for the least or the most, we'll automatically find both. Because we don't know which one is which until we compare values. And actually, it's much more to your advantage to figure out that much both the maximum and the minimum, whenever you answer such a question. Because otherwise, you'll, you won't understand the behavior of the function very well. So the question, we started out with one question, we answered both, we answered two questions. We answered the question what the largest and the, and the, and the smallest value was. Yes. One can also use, the question is, can we use the second derivative test? 
And the answer is yes, we can. In fact, you can actually also stare at this and see that it's a, a, a sum of squares, so it's always um, uh, curving up. It's a parabola with a positive second coefficient. So you can differentiate this twice. If you do, you'll get an eighth plus another eighth, and you'll get a sixteenth. So the second derivative is, six, is one sixteenth, uh, is uh, one fourth. And that's an acceptable way of, of figuring it out. I'll, I'll mention the second derivative test again in this second example. So let me talk about a second example. So again, this is going to be a, oh, another question. The question is, when I say minimum or maximum point, which will I mean? Yeah, so that, that's the, the question. I just repeated the question. So the, the question is, when I say minimum point, what will I mean? Okay? And the answer is that for the purposes of this class, I will probably avoid saying that, but I will say probably where is the minimum achieved, just in order to avoid that. If I actually said it, I often am referring to the graph, and I mean this. And in fact, when you get your little review for the second exam, I'll say exactly that on the review sheet. <laughs> okay? And I'll make this very clear when we're doing this. However, I just want to prepare you for the fact that in real life, and even me when I'm talking uh, colloquially, when I say what's the minimum point of something, I might actually be mixing it up with this, with this other notion here. All right? Okay, so let's do another example. So this is uh, an, an example to get us used to the notion of, of constraints. So we have, so consider a box without a top. Or if you like, we're going to find a box without a top with least surface area for a fixed volume. All right? Find the box without a top with least surface area for a fixed volume. The procedure for, for working this out is the following. You make this diagram and you set up the variables. Right? In this case, we're going to have four names of variables. All right? We have four letters that we have to choose, and we'll choose them in a kind of a standard way. All right? So first, I have to tell you one more thing, which is uh, something that, you'll, that we could calculate separately, but I'm just going to give it to you in advance which is that it turns out that the best box has a square bottom. And that's going to get rid of one of our variables for us. So it's got a square bottom, and so let's draw a picture of it. So here's our box. Well, I guess that goes down like this. Almost. Maybe I should get a little farther down. All right. So here's our box. Let's correct that just a bit. All right. So now, what about the dimensions of this box? Well, this is going to be x, and this is very foreshortened, but it's also x. The bottom is x by x. It's the same dimensions. And then the vertical dimension is y. OK? So far, so good. Now, I, have, I, I promised you two more letter names. I want to compute the volume. All right. The volume is the base is x squared, the height is y, so there's the volume. And then the area, the area is the area of the bottom, which is x squared. That's the bottom. And then there are the four sides. And the four sides are rectangles of dimensions x, y, so it's 4xy. All right, so these are the sides. And remember, 
there's no top. So that's our setup. So now, the difference between this problem and the last problem is that there are two variables floating around, namely x and y, which are not determined, but uh, there's what's called a constraint here. Namely, we fixed the relationship between x and y. And so that means that we can solve for, um, for y in terms of x. So y is equal to v divided by x squared. And then we can plug that into the formula for a. So here we have a, which is x squared plus 4x times v over x squared. Yeah. Uh, the question is, well, you need to know this intuitively. No, that's a that's something that I would have to give to you. I mean, it, it's 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 actually true that that a lot of things the uh, the correct answer is something symmetric. In this last problem, the minimum turned out to be exactly halfway in between because there were sort of equal demands from the two sides. And similarly here, what happens is if you elongate one side, you get less, it's, it's, it actually is a, involved with a two variable problem, namely if you have a rectangle uh, and you have a, a certain amount of length associated with it, what's the optimal thing you can do with that? But I, I, I won't, in other words, uh, the optimal rectangle, the, the least perimeter rectangle turns out to be a square. That's a little sub-problem that leads you to this square bottom. But, uh, but, so that would have been a separate uh, maximum problem, which I'm skipping, because I want to do this slightly more interesting one. All right? OK, so now, here's our formula for A. And now I want to follow the same procedure as before. Namely, we'll look for the critical point, or points. So let's take a look. So again, a is x squared plus 4v over x, and a prime is 2x minus 4v over x squared. So if we set that equal to 0, we get uh, 2x equals 2v over x squared. So 2x cubed. Uh, well, how did that happen to change into 2? Interesting. I guess that's wrong. OK. All right, so this is uh, x cubed is equal to 2v. All right? And so uh, x is equal to 2 to the 1 third, v to the 1 third. All right, so this is the critical point. So we are not done, right? We're not done because we don't even know whether this is going to give us the worst box or the best box from this point of view, the one that uses the most air surface area or the least. So let's check the ends right away to see what's happening. So can somebody tell me what the ends, what the end values of x are? Where does x range from? What's the smallest x can be? Yeah. Okay, the, the, the claim was that the largest x could be root a, because somehow there's this x squared here, and you, you can't get any further past than that. But there's a key feature here of this problem, which is that a is variable. The only thing that's fixed in the problem is v. Okay, so if V is fixed, what do you know about X? Yeah, X is greater than zero. Yeah, the lower end point, that's safe. 
because that has to do geometrically with the fact that we don't have any boxes with negative dimensions. That would be refused by the post office, definitely. It over and above the empty top, which they wouldn't accept either. <laughs> Uh, it's true that x is less than square root of v over y, so that's using this relationship. But notice that y is equal to v over x squared. So 0 to infinity, I've just got a guess there over here. That's right. Here's the upper limit. So th this is really important to realize. This is most problems. Most problems, the variable, if it doesn't have a limitation, usually just goes out to infinity. And infinity is a very important end for the problem. It's usually an easy end to the problem, too. All right? So there's the possibility that if we push all the way down to x equals 0, we'll get a better box. It would be a very strange box, a little bit like our vanishing uh, enclosure, and uh, maybe an infinitely long box, also a very inconvenient one might be the best box. We'll have to see. All right? So let's just take a look at what happens. So we're looking at a at 0 plus, right? And that's x squared plus 4v over x with x at 0 plus. So what happens to that? Notice right here, this is going to infinity. All right? So this is infinite. So that turns out to be a bad box. All right, let's take a look at the other end. So this is x squared plus 4v over x, x going to infinity. And again, this term here means that this thing is infinite. So the shape of this thing, I'll draw this tiny little schematic diagram over here. The shape of this thing is like this. Right? And so when we find that one turnaround point, which happened to be at this strange point, two thirds, uh, 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 two to the one third, sorry, v to the one third, that is going to be the minimum. All right. So we've just discovered that it's the minimum, which is just what we were hoping for. This is going to be the optimal box. Now. Uh, since you asked earlier, and, and since it's worth checking this as well, let's also check an alternative justification. So an alternative to checking ends is the second derivative test. I do not recommend the second derivative test. I try my best when I give you problems to make it really hard to apply the second derivative test. But in this example, the function is simple enough so that it's perfectly OK. If you take the derivative here, remember, this was uh, whatever it was, 2x minus uh, 4v over x squared. If I take the second derivative, it's 2 plus uh, 8v over x cubed, and that's positive. So this thing is concave up, and that's consistent with its being a, the critical point is a min. Is a minimum point. See now I almost said is a min, as opposed to minimum point. So watch out. Yes. You're, you're one step ahead of me. The question is, is this the answer to the question of would we have to give y and a and so on and so forth? So again, I want to this is this is something that I want to emphasize and take my time with right now because it depends what kind of real life problem you're answering, what kind of answer is appropriate. So so far we've found the critical point. We haven't found the critical value, we haven't found the dimensions of the box. Okay, so I, I, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this exactly in order to address these questions. 
So first of all, the value of y. So, so far we have x is 2 to the 1 third, v to the 1 third. And certainly if you're going to build the box, you also want to know what the y value is. The y value is going to be, um, uh, let's see, well, it's, it's v over x squared, so that's v divided by 2 to the 1 third, v to the 1 third squared, which comes out to be uh, 2 to the minus 2 thirds, v to the 1 third. Okay? So there's the y value. On top of that, we could figure out the, um, the value of a. All right? So that's also a perfectly reasonable part of the answer. Depending on what one is interested in, you might care how much money it's going to cost you to build this box, this optimal box. And so you plug in the value of a. So a, let's see, is up here. It's x squared plus 4 uh, v over x. So that's going to be um, 2 to the 1 third v to the 1 third squared plus 4v divided by 2 to the 1 third v to the 1 third. All right? And if you work that all out, what you get turns out to be 3 times 2 to the 1 third v to the 2 thirds. All right? So, so if you like, one way of answering this question is, is these three these three things. That would be the, the, the minimum point corresponding to the graph. That would be the, the, the answer to this question. But the reason why I'm carrying it out in such detail is I want to show you that there are much more meaningful ways of answering this question. So let me, let me explain that. So let me go through some more meaningful answers here. The, the first more meaningful answer is the following sort of idea. Simply, they were what are known as dimensionless. Variables. So the first thing that you notice is the scaling law. That a divided by v to the two thirds is the thing that's a dimensionless quantity. That happens to be three times two to the one third. Okay. So that's one thing. If you want to expand the volume, you'll have to expand the area by the two thirds power of the volume. And if you think of the area as being in say um, cubic. Uh, sorry, um, square inches and the, um, the volume of the box is being in cubic inches, then you can see that this is a dimensionless quantity and you have a dimensionless number here, which is a characteristic independent of what A and V were. The other uh, dimensionless quantity is the ratio of Y to X, or X to Y. All right? So again, that's, that's inches divided by inches. And it's 2 to the 1 third v to the 1 third divided by 2 to the minus 2 thirds v to the 1 third, which happens to be 2. All right? So this is actually the best answer to the question. And it shows you that the box is a 2 to 1 box. If this is 2 and this is 1, that's the good box. That is just the shape if you like, and it's the optimal shape. And I, certainly, that, aesthetically, that's the, that's the cleanest answer to the question. All right, there was a question right here. Yes. Could, could you repeat that? I couldn't hear. The question is, could we have gotten the answer if we weren't told that the bottom was square? The answer is, yes, in 1802 with multivariable, you would have to have three letters here, an X, a Y, and a Z, if you like, and then you'd have to work with all three of them. All right? So 
I separated it out into one, there's a, there's a separate one variable problem that you can do for the base, and then this is a second one variable problem for this other thing, and it's just two consecutive one variable problems that solve the multivariable problem. Or, as I say, in uh, multivariable calculus, you can just do it all in one step. Right? Yeah. Why did I divide x by y? Uh, rather than y by x, or, or in any... So, again, what I was aiming for was dimensionless quantities. So, x and y are measured in the same units, and also the proportions of the box. So, that's another word for this, is proportions are something that's universal, independent of, of the volume V. It's something you can say about any box at any scale, whether it be, you know, something by Christo, and, you know, in the common, maybe we'll get him here to do some fancy, uh, uh, the proportions is with geometric problems, typically when, when, when there's a scaling to the problem where the answer is the same at small scales and at large scales, this is capturing that. So that's why the, yeah, the ratios are what's capturing that. And that's why it's aesthetically the nicest thing to ask. Okay? So what exactly is the ratio of the area to the volume of the ratio? Unfortunately, this number is a, really, uh, is a really obscure number, so it doesn't, the question is what does this tell us? The only thing that I want to emphasize is what's on the left-hand side here which is, the, it's the area to the two-thirds power of the volume, so it's a dimensionless quantity that happens to be this. Uh, if you do this, for example, uh, in general with planar diagrams, uh, circumference to area is, the, is, a, is a bad ratio to take. What you want to take is the square of circumference to area, because the square of circumference has the same dimensions, that is, say, inches squared to area, which, has, which is in square inches. So again, it's these dimensionless quantities that you want to, to uh, cook up. And those are the ones that will have universal properties. There's a, the, 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 the most famous of these is that the circle is the, encloses the most area for its circumference. And again, that's only true if you measure air, you, you take the square of the circumference, you, you, you do the units correctly, all right? Okay, anyway, okay, so we're here, we've got a, uh, uh, shape, we've got an answer to this question, and I now want to do this problem, well, let's put it this way. I wanted to do this problem by a different method. I think I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the time to do it. So I want to I do this problem by a slightly different method here. So here's example two by implicit differentiation. So the same example, but now I'm going to do it by implicit differentiation. And I now, I'll, I'll tell you the advantages and the disadvantages to this method here. So the situation is, you have to start the same way. So here is the starting place of the problem, all right? And we're taking the, we're aiming, the goal was, the minimum of A with V constant. So this was the situation that we were in. And now, what I want to do is just differentiate. All right? The function Y is implicitly a function of X, so I can differentiate the first expression. And that yields 0 is equal to 2xy plus x squared y prime. Right? So this is giving me my implicit formula for y prime. So y prime is equal to minus 2xy divided by x squared. Or in other words, minus 2y divided by x. And then I also have the derivative of a with respect to x. Now, you may notice I'm not using primes quite as much because I'm, all of the variables are varying, and so here I'm emphasizing that it's the differentiation is with respect to the variable x. And uh, this becomes 2x plus 4y plus 4xy prime. So again, this is 
uh, using the product rule. And now I can plug in for uh, what y prime is, which is right above it. So this is 2x plus 4y plus 4x times minus 2y over x. Okay? And that's equal to 0. And so let's get that, gather that together. So what do we have? We have 2x plus 4y, and then all together this is 8 minus 8y equals 0. So that's the same thing as 2x is equal to 4y. Right? The minus 4y goes to the other side. And so um, x over y is equal to 2. So this, I, I claim, well, so uh, you, you, you have to decide for yourself, but I claim that this is faster. All right? It's faster, and also it gets to the heart of the matter, which is the scale invariant proportions, which is basically also nicer. So it gets to the nicer answer also. So those are the, those are the advantages that this has. So it's faster, and it uh, gets to this, I'm going to call it nicer. And the disadvantage is um, uh, did not check whether this critical point is a max min. Okay, so we didn't quite finish the problem, but we got to the answer very fast. Yeah, question. How would you check it? Well, so it gives you a candidate. Uh, the answer is, so the question is, how would you check it? The answer is, that for this particular problem, the only way to do it is to do something like this. All right? So in other words, it doesn't save you that much time. But with many, many examples, you actually can tell immediately that at the two ends, the thing is, is say, zero, and inside it's positive, things like that. So in many, many cases, this is just as good. All right? OK. So now, I'm going to change subjects here, but the subject that I'm going to talk about next is almost, is very, very closely linked. Namely, I talked about implicit differentiation. Now we're going to just talk about dealing with lots of variables and rates of change. So essentially, we're going to talk about the same type of thing. So I'm going to tell you about a subject which is called related rates, which is really just another excuse for getting used to setting up variables and equations. So here we go. Related rates. And I'm going to illustrate this with one example today, one, one tomorrow. So here's my example for today. So you're, again, this is going to be a police problem, but this is going to be a word problem, but and, sorry, I don't want to scare you, no police. Uh, uh, well, there are police in the story, but they're not present. Uh, so, but I'm going to draw it immediately with a diagram because, because I'm going to save us the, the trouble. Although, you know, the, the point here is to get from the words to the, um, to the diagram. Okay, so you have the police, and they're 30 feet from the road. And here's the road. And you're coming along here in your, um, let's see, in your car going in this direction here. And the police have radar, which is bouncing off of your car. And what they read off 
is that you have that you're 50 feet away. All right. They also know that you're approaching along the line of the radar at a rate of 80 feet per second. Okay. Now, the question is, are you speeding? Right? That's the question. So, so when you're speeding, uh, by the way, uh, 95 feet per second is about 65 miles per hour. So that's the that's the uh, threshold here. So, so what I want to do now is show you how you set up a problem like this. All right, this distance is 50, this is 30, and because it's the distance to a straight line, you know that this is a right angle. So we know that this is a right triangle. And this is set out to be a right triangle, which is, which is an easy one, a three, four, five right triangle, just so that we can do the computations uh, easily, all right? So now the question is, how do we put the letters in to make this problem work, to figure out what the, the rate of change is? Now let me, let me explain that uh, right now, and we will actually do the computation next time. So the first thing is, you have to understand what's changing and what's not. And we're going to use t for time in seconds, okay? And now, an important distance here is the distance to this foot of this perpendicular. So I'm going to name that x, all right? I'm going to give that letter x. Now, x is very, the reason why I need a letter for it as opposed to this 40 is that it's going to have a rate of change with respect to t. And in fact, it's related to the question is whether dx dt is, is faster or slower than 95. Okay? So that's the thing that's varying. Now there's something else that's varying. This distance here is also varying, so we need a letter for that. We do not need a letter for this, because it's never changing. We're assuming the police are part. They're not ready to roar out and catch you just yet. And they're certainly not in motion when they've got their radar guns aimed at you. So you, there's sort of, you need to know something about the sociology and style of, of, of police uh, when they're Okay, so you need to know, know things about the real world. Now the last bit is, what about this, this 80 here? So this is how fast you're approaching. Now that's measured along the radar gun. I claim that that's d by dt of this quantity here. So this d is also changing. That's why we needed a letter for it too. So um, next time we'll just put that all together and compute dx by dt. You're just on time. You see that the very interesting formulations of a problem and then a primary concept in calculus to help us to solve this. Now remember, you all have a challenge in your team. You need to learn how to formulate a problem of your team's choice. It's very much like this. You saw how um, Professor David Gerson had used the idea of min and max to demonstrate solutions to some kind of problem. And then he's leading us into formulating problems that could be solved by applying the same concept. Now he's helping us to formulate something that is very practical in our life. Now think along this line in your team to think about how you can make the best use of the derivatives applications, particularly the maxima and the minima, to solve similar problems in our daily living. In your team, each team needs to formulate some kind of problem, and I'm going to give you at least 10 to 15 minutes this Friday to formulate your problem, okay? By showing you different type of example problem. And then I think we'll come back to this in lecture Number 13. Okay, this let you see how this problem is formulated and give you time to practice formulating your problem. That's the applications of mathematics in today's world. Okay, allow me to take attendance and you can go. Remember, you have a challenge. You need to do a project in this month, okay?
and you need to come up with a proposal to report and a PowerPoint. Wecky, thank you. Johnson, thank you. Alex, not here today. Stella, thank you. Viviana, thank you. Jordan, thank you. Star, thank you. Chaos, thank you. Novia, thank you. And then Louise, thank you. David, David's not here. Sentient, thank you. Viola, thank you. And then Candy, thank you. Bailey, thank you. Iris, thank you. Bella, Bella, not here today. Cindy, Cindy, not here today. Vivian, thank you. And then Patrick, thank you. Jeanette, thank you. Ivy, thank you. Senior, uh, thank you. Michelle, thank you. And then Nisi, thank you. Doris, thank you. Kelvin, here. Jeremy, thank you. And then Andy, thank you. Thank you very much. You're free to go, come back, and hopefully I can give you back your test table on Friday. Okay? All right, next you study the suggested answer.